Hello everybody, it's, uh, we run about half an hour late, been a busy morning, so um, all part of the fun. And thanks for all the birthday wishes, I uh, didn't know Jane put that up, but anyway, it's there, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, interesting morning, as I say, with John Luke, but I'll explain all that again in a, in a minute. Um, first of all, uh, overall this week, a couple of good things happening. Um, uh, we've managed to uh, stir up a bit of interest in Gregor's boat, and now there is a team that's involved with uh, hopefully going out to uh, successfully um, have a crack at finding Gregor's boat and bringing it back and, and getting Gregor uh, um, back involved in some way. So uh, watch this space. Uh, uh, we hope it all works. It'd be great to see the boat uh, both recovered and then possibly even sailing again. So who knows what happens there. And I'm sure Gregor will talk about it later on. Um, the team are coming into Western Australia and uh, they'll get together with the boat and get things sorted. So we'll keep you updated as they uh, put out information on what's happening. So that's kind of cool. Um, the, um, the situation with Tapio, just plodding along, he's going really well, uh, back end of the fleet. No news on, on uh, Igor yet, um, we're expecting any day. We, we thought we would have heard this week, but we haven't, um, although his time is running out now. It's the 5th of January, leaves like a bit over a week to get back to Australia, get on the boat and so on, so it's not looking good for Igor to take off. We set a timeline of uh, January the 14th to get underway sort of around that date. If there was a few days over, we can stretch that. But it's very important that he gets across um, the uh, Pacific side of the Southern Ocean and around Cape Horn before the end of March. And uh, if that doesn't happen, then um, he can stay in the event. There's no real time limit as long as we believe it's still safe. And that will mean not leaving earlier than uh, the middle of November this year uh, and carry on around the corner, so uh, around Cape Horn. So we'll just see what evolves there. Um, just back to Tapio, uh, he's happy enough. I mean, taking a long time and we're really hoping that at some point he'll get a chance to get those barnacles off and he'll start moving again the way a yacht normally would. It's very obvious now whenever you look at the speeds and the winds that he's got, those barnacles are causing havoc. Um, he's resigned himself to the fact that it's going to take time, but boy, um, all kind of interesting and we'd love to see him here for the prize giving, as you know, but anyway, that's how it works. Um, I've never heard uh, Istvan so happy as when he finally got around Cape Horn and also uh, actually got some water. He got 50 litres before and another 30 after, and I think he's got some more in the last 24 hours or so. Uh, anyway, making good time, and he's steering uh, pedestal gearboxes hanging together. Um, so that's all, you know, uh, good for, for Istvan. That, that, that's cool. Uh, the, the issue with Uku and the storms, that was quite something this week. He had one... You know, neat little number come through. He slotted in there and, and survived okay. It was was uh, a little bit of work, but he did take one wave down below, took a couple hundred litres uh, into the boat. Uh, didn't damage any of the electronics. Uh, they've set it up with flaps over the electronics, and I'm not sure how the wave came down, you know, whether it burst in in a rush or whether whatever, but 200 litres is quite a lot inside the boat. So uh, no damage, and that's good. And then, of course, we had this really monster storm. It's still out there. It's just massive, and it grew from nowhere. Um, uh, Uku decided to try and run northeast and get away from it. Uh, unfortunately, it followed him a little bit. It actually moved a little bit towards him, um, and that's why he hooked up in the tail end of it, um, but survived okay, and uh, the forecasting was hard to predict because it was in the formative stages of it building. It was only, by the time it got to Uku, it was really quite big and strong in the middles and stuff, um, but it was only about 36 hours old from nothing to this big storm. And then once it went past him, it kept growing and it's quite massive. Um, but he got through it okay and um, no damage to the boat. Uh, he's on his way north again. I know he's happy about that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Mark Slats is uh, doing okay. He's into the northeast trades now. That was an objective. He got through the doldrums pretty well, had lots of thunderstorms and, and uh, probably lightning and bits and pieces. Not much fun, but he kept moving really well. And now he's on the hunt for Jean-Luc, so um, he'll uh, make the most of that. He's got consistent trades now. He'll make consistent average speeds and get up there real quick. And then there's Jean-Luc. Well, you know, the t this whole time penalty thing is turning into a, a, a bigger and bigger bigger thing, I suppose. Um, what I'd say is simply this, that uh, Jean-Luc uh, agreed to everything about the time penalty in terms of the way it was going to be implemented and the way he had to uh, wait for a set time. Now, the difference here is that um, we need to monitor it on the tracker and he needs a definite time because his sextants aren't working that well. So he's not sure exactly when he gets over 20 degrees uh, north latitude. So we set it up that uh, we estimated when he would be there by our calculations and set a time limit. 
a time designation to start the penalty, and that was 10 minutes past midnight last night. So at that point, wherever Jean-Luc is, it doesn't matter. He starts his penalty from there, and it becomes very simple. It just means from that point, he can't go any further north, and he's got to be south of that point for 18 hours. And while he's south of that point for 18 hours, he is serving his time. He can move anywhere he wants within 40 miles of that point before he can cross north. Now, what actually happened, I, I, after that, I went to bed, got up this morning at uh, 6 o'clock, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It's what it, oh, uh, le- a little bit less than that, but anyway. He sailed down on a short tack, right, and went down for about an hour and a half, and then he tacked around, and he came back again. And so an hour and a half later, he was back to the same position, and then he continued on for another hour and a half or so, and then came down. So within three hours of being at the southern position, he'd actually crossed over his position and gone north again. And what I've got to say here is it was it blew me away. I couldn't believe it. We immediately sent him a message and said, hey, Jean-Luc, you're over the line. You've been over the line again for three hours. He was fortunately tacking back at that point. So he was already, he was very close to recrossing the line south again. But he'd effectively been north of the line for three hours, which was unbelievable. Now. No matter what anyone says, that that something went wrong. And when I told him, he then we sent him a message. He rang and said, "You've got to be kidding! I'm not north of the line." And I said, "Well, sorry, you have been for the last three hours." And he was completely confused and couldn't understand how he could have been north of the line because anyone that's aware of navigation will know that you don't need a GPS, you don't need a sextant, you don't need to know much to stay away from a line if you can't cross it for three hours when you're sailing. It's called dead reckoning navigation. You have course and speed and you just sail south. You keep sailing south to stay away from that line. So something went wrong. I'm not sure what it was. It's really unfortunate. Effectively, it's added, you know, because the time spent north of the line isn't counted for the 18 hours. And that's in the notice of race. It's in the rules. So until he got below that line, the the clock starts again and he's using up the 18 hours. Now, just to explain this again, because a lot of people commenting about it, the, the, the box rule and the whole concept of staying below the line was explained to all the entrants in the sailing briefings, okay? So all of the entrants are very clear on how it works. It was in the notice of race for nearly two years before the start of the race. Our role is to manage the notice of race without f- fear or favour to anyone, okay? And so you can see our position. We have to be very strict and very specific on that. It, it's very simple. And... Um, uh, it's unfortunate because we all want Jean-Luc to keep going and get, get on the way to the finish line and stuff. But, but the reality is something went wrong. I'm not sure. I've got no idea why Jean-Luc decided to tack back so quickly and, and uh, go north. But it's not too tricky to understand uh, and it's very easy to see. And it's solved simply. I mean, he's already back across the line. He's serving his time. He can move to within 40 miles of his original position uh, when he started heading south. And uh, that's you know, obviously what he's going to do because he needs to get over to the east as well. And uh, very shortly, uh, hopefully in another 10 hours or so or whatever, uh, he will be able to turn around and come north. And there's, um, that, that, that's the reality. So, so we see it as uh, GGR is in a no-win situation in that one. You know, we're not going you know, to change the rules for Jean-Luc. It's, unfortunately, it's unfortunate, but it is very simple. It's just stay away from that line. And as I say, it's, it's, um, something happened, something went wrong. I don't know what it is, but I couldn't believe it when I saw that he'd gone north of the line. And uh, when you go north of the line, the, t- the clock stops on your penalty you have to get back down again some people think there's an extra penalty being added because he went north of the line that's not the case it's just simply that your time runs when you're south of the line okay so uh, you just carry on and stay south of that and um, uh, as I say all you need is a compass so um, so that's that's uh, this week in quick summary I've got a bunch of questions here and some of this will come up again in the questions as well so we'll get straight on to that so uh, Terry Seneschal uh, wanted to know if Istvan would get a credit for delivering water to an, a long route competitor, um, a time credit against his time penalty. And yes, he did. He was given a six hour credit uh, against uh, he, uh, his penalty for actually cutting the corner of the no go zone previously. So that cancelled it out. So he was given a credit for that, but he still has a time penalty for both a uh, unauthorized satellite phone call and a, a stop in a port so uh, i think if i remember right it's 24 hours so istvan has a 24-hour time penalty to serve in the penalty box when he gets to 20 degrees north exactly the same as what jean Luc will be doing uh, right now so tom van hoff runders what happens uh, 
when you've done a solo non-stop circumnavigation, uh, do you, when it's over emotionally and psychologically, do you see life differently and is it life-changing? Well, and he wanted to know my opinion. Well, I've never done a solo non-stop. Um, I've done a solo circumnavigation with three stops. And, uh, but I have done some interesting expeditions where you go through some interesting pressures and, and so I understand that whole concept of what happens when you get back, do you change and so on. There's a few, and I know a lot of people that have done solo non-stop circumnavigations and the first thing I'd say is they all have the opinion that a lot of the little things, a lot of the trivial things take on no relevance. You know, you're not worried about a lot of the things that, that the majority of people in society take and place as being very important become less so important. Uh, the more important things become family, friends, people, uh, real things, not so much um, uh, consumer things and so on, you know, changing your phone every year, all that stuff. You, you do look at life a little bit differently. Your values, values do change. But the other thing I'd say is that when I watch people who have done that, you sometimes slip back into the normal routine within the next four or five years or six years or so on, you, you get sort of sucked into the whole system and the routine again. So, so it just depends. It affects different people different ways. Um, the body and the mind is really acceptable to change and uh, it's influenced a lot by your environment that you're in. So when you first get back, it's more intense maybe than, than uh, after years and years later. Um, so Guy Waits was wondering, uh, given the performance differences with the Joshua class for uh, 2022 over the Suheili class, would we consider a staggered start? So the Joshua boats start differently from the um, Suheili boats. We did actually have that as the original concept, but uh, on discussions with Jean-Luc and a few others, uh, we realised that, um, first of all, the Joshua boats have got some speed impediments. They don't have any spinnakers. Uh, they'll be using a trim tab wind vane rather than a commercially available auxiliary rudder wind vane with, um, uh, or a servo pendulum system. So the course on the Joshua is going to be a bit more like that under wind vane rather than like that. It's a heavier boat. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jean-Luc said many times he could sail rings around the Joshua, um, and I tend to believe him. So what we've done is it's a single start, so both classes will start at exactly the same time. There is an overall line on as winner, and there is like two class winners, and that's not dissimilar to what used to happen in like the BOC, when you had a 40, 50 foot class and a 60 foot class. So they are a bit different, but they'll be racing together. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was another sailor like Jean-Luc sailing in the fleet in a Suheili class boat, and normal Joshua sailors in the Joshua boats, Jean-Luc probably, would probably give them a run for their money. So, um, so it might not be as big a difference as you think. So, um, so it's a one-start situation. Uh, Michael uh, Simpson was worrying about, in 2022, uh, will there be changes in the use of the sat phones for situations like when you get a mast damage, like Jean-Luc had, or uh, if you have major equipment damage? And the short story is no. Uh, the communications rules for 2022 will be the same as 2018. Um, satellite phones can be used for anything to do with distress, an emergency, um, you know, talking to rescue coordination centres, talking to whomever, or talking to GGR if it's important. You know, we call them safety calls, but the restrictions will remain the same because we want the communications to be um, just HF radios only, and that's going back to 1968. So, so there won't be any particular change to that. It doesn't if you get a major equipment failure, you don't. We're not allowing people to call up their support crew and get advice or opinion on the on the satellite phone. They can do that on their radio. Right? And if they've got an urgent call, an emergency call to distress rescue coordination centres, they can do that. Or if they're worried about something, they can call GGR control. So uh, the rules on the phones will stay the same in 2022. Um, John Tisdall was asking, uh, any thoughts about changing the setup of my boat, the, the Joshua, in 2022? Um, based on what I've seen on this edition of the GGR. Now, this is really interesting because I am actually starting to reconsider a few things in sailing in general based on what I'm seeing in the GGR. And it particularly relates to the rigs, the fact that we've had these dismastings. And I'm starting to think outside the box a bit. Not, and I know a lot of other people are as well. And as you know, uh, Sir Robert Knox Johnson is doing a, a review on different things that are happening. And I'll never forget, Gregor uh, McGookin made a very interesting comment. He had a brand new rig on his boat. And when he got rolled and the boat dismasted, he said a simple comment, the lower section of the mast column below the first spreaders broke into three pieces, okay? 
And it's made me think then, as well, something weird's happening, you know, when these boats are rolling over and so on. And maybe they need to be supported more than the traditional single or two spreader rig. And then I go back, I think I mentioned this once before, Lars Bergstrom, who's a friend that I knew many years ago, he's not with us anymore. He had an interesting concept for rigs, lots of extra wires and so on. And then I started to think, well, maybe we need another set of spreaders, like short spreaders in between where the lowers are to help, like a, like a diamond spreader arrangement on the bottom of multi-hull masks, because I've got a multi-hull at the moment, where they, they're using these little spreaders to hold the column even more rigid. So I'm just looking at it as an open book. And then just a couple of days ago, I was looking at a, an open 60 here, a mocha boat uh, on the marina. And uh, lo and behold, exactly what I was thinking, they've already been doing probably for years, where if you imagine they've got one set of spreaders on this particular boat, and where the lowers come down, they have a set of a small short set of spreaders with another diamond from the base of the first spreader comes down and in back to the base. So I'm starting to think about all these things, and I'll have some really interesting discussions later on with riggers about this whole problem um, of trying to keep the mast in the boat. So that's the biggest thing I'll be looking at. I've got no answers yet, but certainly I think it's worth looking at um, this whole issue about um, trying to keep mast sections in column, uh, in a rollover or a pitch pole and so on. And uh, who knows what the answer will be. But yes, uh, we're starting to think, rethink some issues. Um, Jack uh, Chancellor, uh, with, why is there a no-go zone and, and uh, how do they know where it, how do the entrants know where it is and why do they sometimes get let through it? Well, the no-go zone's there for two main reasons. One is to keep them out of the bad weather south and keep them out of the ice areas because in, even in summer, you can get ice extending quite a long way north. Secondly, um, the uh, rescue coordination centres around the world, including Australia and South Africa and so on, they recommend the boats stay high because then it's easier to get to those spots if there is a, a rescue required. If they're deep south, it's really difficult to get down there and a lot more risk for them. So we're partially complying to their requests as well. How do the entrants know they're on the zone? Well, firstly, they navigate and getting a noon site, which gives you an east-west position line, is the easiest thing to do with a sextant. So it's very easy to find a latitude just with one site and a few calculations. And secondly, if they get to within 30 miles or half a degree of the zone, we'll give them a message and say, hey guys, you're 30 miles north of the zone, so they can keep out. And the occasions when they can go through the zone is it's set to generally keep them up there but if there's a storm coming and they need to dip through it or go down and it will open the zone for them to let them run from a storm or so on. We don't want it to be a barrier for safety reasons. It's, it's really just generally to keep them up in that area. So, so it's all pretty simple there as well. Um, okay, uh, Steve Cottrell wants to know um, how the morale and how the, the entrants keep themselves enthused once the leaders start finishing, in other words, the other entrants behind the leaders, uh, are they there just to win the race and do they feel depressed when the winners get in and things like that? Um, obviously, I don't really know because I'm not them, but just looking at the fleet and the, the, that we have there at the moment and knowing the, the characters as I do, uh, Mark and Jean-Luc are in a pitch battle right now. Uku, he'll be happy to get home. He's uh, obviously quite thinking, wow, I'm potentially on a podium position for third. He would love that. That's uh, really keeping him up. But I've got to tell you, he is sailing his boat to get home. He won't stress the boat. He's sailing efficiently and you know, sort of as fast as he wants to, but he's not blind racing. He just wants to get home. So uh, nothing will change there. And his goal will be to finish line. It'll be like, wow, the most incredible thing probably he's ever done in his life, except maybe having twin boys. But um, but anyway, and then Istvan will be the same. He's done it before. Uh, this is a race. Um, he's done really well. He's, he's, he's running fourth. Um, he'll be off his tree when he gets to the finish line. Same thing again. His objective is to get there. He's got a long way to go. And the same with Tapio. You know, Tapio's resigned himself. So they all have their reasons for being there and, and the race and the finish. The race is not so important as the finish line. So, so each one's different, but I don't think they're worried about it. They'll be excited uh, themselves. You know, Tapio, Uku and, uh, um, and uh, Isfan will be, they'll be excited to see who's going who's gonna to finish first out of, out of uh, Mark and uh, Jean-Luc. So all is good. Uh, Robert Reynolds, um, uh, oh, Uku has two wind vanes on the back of his boat. Um, one's the hydrovane gear and the other is uh, it's similar to an Aries. Um, might be an early model, but I, I think it's a bit of a hybrid. 
Um, but anyway, the reality is the boat came with that earlier model Ares, um, but Uku had sailed previously around the world with the Hydrovane, and just in the last few days, he thought, no, nah, I've got to go Hydrovane. So it was the last week or so, I think the wind vane arrived about five days before the start of the race, and he bolted it on the back and, and took off, and he's been using the Hydrovane exclusively ever since. He's got the other one there, which he can use if something happened to the Hydrovane, but so far, so good, touch wood. The hydrovane has been steering the boat all the way around, and uh, he hasn't had a problem. Um, and also, uh, Ertrin uh, from last year pulled out after a week or so. He had two wind vanes as well. He had a similar situation. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, it's an interesting idea to have two types of vanes uh, as a backup because wind vanes are very important. Uh, Dem Edu wants to know: Will uh, 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 will we see? Oh, will we see the storm footage uh, from on board the boats when the entrants get back? Um, yeah, I hope so. Um, you know, different things have happened to different sailors. Uh, we've seen a lot of, seen a bit of um, uh, RA's uh, footage from the storms. Uh, we haven't seen much of what uh, uh, Philippe Pesh had since Cape Town. We haven't seen any of that yet. Uh, obviously, I'm hoping Susie managed to secure her, her uh, uh, films and bits and pieces when she got off the boat. I haven't asked her. I'm assuming she has, so eventually we might see that. Um, so the, every situation is different, but yeah, we'd hope to get all that together and uh, incorporate that into the into the documentary as well. So same with Loic. We haven't uh, I haven't actually physically seen Loic. We've we've uh, had emails and, and chats and stuff, but um, he'll be around here, I'm sure, when the others turn up at, at the line. He's been enjoying family and stuff. So so yes, uh, you will. And uh, Jesse and uh, Tina will be arriving here in a couple of weeks to really to start filming the final parts for the docos and so on. And then we'll look for funding and try and put the the doco together as quick as we can um okay sasha ebert um again in relation to joshua class and my boat for 22 will i be using a trim tab wind vane system a steering system self-steering system on the joshua class yes all the joshua boats uh, have to use a trim tab the same as bernard Tessia had on the original joshua it's a system which is uh, really reliable really simple it's not as efficient and, and uh, direct as a servo pendulum system or an auxiliary rudder commercial systems that are available now like the hydrovane um, but it does the job and i can tell you that from just reading uh, uh, bernard book he says it does the job it's not perfect but it's okay and i believe him you know those systems are uh, simple and the good news is it's reliable so i'm reasonably confident once it's on the boat and working it should get all the way around so uh, and and that's a requirement of the of the class rule for joshua's uh, kevin hale um uh, John Luke must go, uh, must cross back north across the line after he served his time penalty uh, within 40 miles of where he started going south. And the question was, how will he know and will we advise him? Well, the reason he should know is because he should be running a, a simple uh, dead reckoning navigation plot. Uh, on a bit of paper or on his chart. So every time he goes a course at, at uh, this direction, he should plot that on the chart for the time and the distance. And then when he changes tack, it should be time and distance up here. And so he should be running a plot for the 18 hours. And within 18 hours of the point that he started from, without using a GPS or without using a sextant or anything like that, he should know roughly where he is. And you wouldn't go to 39 miles or something like that. When you get, get to about 30 miles, that's enough. And then start heading north. So, so that's how that works. And yes, we will advise them as well, just towards the end when their time's just about up. We'll have a look at that and we'll say, yep, okay, looks like you're in the clear. Uh, we're not obligated to do that, um, but we obviously would. Uh, so we will. Um, that's how that works as well. Um, Ian Bennett. Uh, oh, this is a classic. Okay. Ian Bennett is from, uh, coming across from the UK to see the winners come into uh, uh, La Sable de Lone at the end. And he wants to know when to book. He's got three days off work. He's going to come over from England to the thing and he wants to know when to book. Because when he did that for the Vendée, he missed the, missed the Vendée boat finishing by two hours. And the short story there is, Ian, that um, you need to uh, keep a lookout for what's going on on Facebook. That'll give you a rough idea of ETAs. And if you really need to know now, um, send me a message and I'll give you the best bet. Uh, or leave it to the very latest that you have to book your flights or your train or whatever you're doing. Um, send me an email and I'll, I'll give you an answer. But, or send me a message on Facebook. Um, but at this stage, and I'm not suggesting Jean-Luc is going to be first, 
But at this stage, Jean-Luc is saying he's going to be here around the 26th of January. Okay, so it could be a day or so either side of that, two or three days even, depending on what that low pressure system is in the North Atlantic that's going to give him the winds to come up to the last bit. But the later you can leave it, and I'm saying all this obviously for others that are looking, and there's quite a few coming into the finish, um, the longer you can leave it to book your flights and accommodation and stuff, the better off you'll be, and uh, we're happy to give you answers. But at this stage, let's say the 26th of January. Um, Dean Elliston uh, what's, wants to know what social media access do the e entrants have on board um, and can uh, GGR sort of control what they're seeing on social media? Basically, they can't see anything from social media um, because they don't have computers. They don't, all they've got is their HF radio. Uh, but what they, what they sometimes do is like this report, for instance, um, uh, some radio operators have recorded this in an audio sense and they've played it back over the radio to entrance. I know Mark Slats has done that a few times. He'll, uh, previously in the race, he'll, they'll tell us, oh, I heard your report the other day. And I say, what? <laughs> so, so they can re record it going back and that's really about it. They can't see any of the posts. Um, the same uh, people sending Uku best wishes and John Luke, sometimes the, uh, uh, the radio operators will actually read out those best wishes and so on, the comments that people are making. So they do get some feedback, but they can't see anything on the social media on board. Um, Dave Butler um, uh, wants to know, this is the last question, uh, when you're circumnavigating, you're using short sleep patterns, you know, like getting up all the time every few hours to check. Um, how long does it take to get back into a normal routine? Um, well, that uh, depends on each individual skipper, obviously. Um, so I can only speak from my own experience, and it's, and it's very defined and very regular. It happens every time. The first thing that happens when I get off the boat the first night, uh, if I'm in a hotel or something or wherever, I just crash. I'm gone. I'm completely gone. I'm out of it and really enjoy it. But, or the, or the, the other thing that happens is when you get your first shower, uh, this is sort of, how you're in the shower and you, you shut your eyes, and you end up ramming the walls because you're overcompensating. You've still got your sea legs, and then you're trying to get land legs, and you start to sway a bit. And because you're used to the boat with your eyes shut, you'll overcompensate, and you I do that all the time, just slam into the walls while you're in the shower. Anyway, first night, dead to the world. Second night, third night, fourth night, it's like, it's like you're winding down. It's unbelievable. You wake up during the night, you, you know, I'll be feel, you know, on the walls and on the bed head to play an autopilot or, or whatever. Who's on watch? You know, who's steering? What's going on? And you know, go back to sleep. You wake up again and you go, whoa, what's going on? And that happens every time. And it slowly winds down for me, depending on how long the exposure was, whether it was sort of like six weeks or, or two weeks or whatever. Um, it slowly winds down over a number of days. But you do get back into it normally, so not too bad. Okay, that's about it. So, um Thanks a lot, and we'll uh, see you again uh, in a week. Uh, things are getting very close now for Jean-Luc. We're actually planning that, and uh, if you're watching this in Le Sable de Lone, uh, we are planning another public briefing and media briefing about 10 days before the first boat is due to arrive, and it's in GGR office, so we might see you there. And um, just wish Jean-Luc the best on uh, getting uh, back north across the line and heading to the finish line. Thanks a lot. See you later.